I was once a child with a dream, looking up to the stars. Now I'm an adult in a spaceship. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to take a relaxing vacation to the moon or even beyond like Mars? All fiction and no substance? That possibility might be a lot closer to becoming a reality than you might think. Business tycoons and individuals with a firm gaze towards the stars have set lofty goals to be the first to offer entirely run services to destinations in outer space. Stick around as we explore today's topic about the feasibility of commercial space flight. Commercial space flight is very much in its infancy, and so is the technology that powers it. The birth of space flight is traditionally attributed to international rivalries and their respective government-funded space agencies like NASA, the FAA and DOD, to name a few in the US. This time, a group of wealthy private individuals have joined their ranks. Billionaires have made it their mission statement to unlock the fascination of space and eventually make it accessible to everyone. This privilege has thus far been reserved solely for trained space crews. The anchor lies in the word commercial. The supporters of this idea are convinced that, if successful, it would usher in a new era for humanity to claim its perceived place among the stars and endless opportunities for Earth itself. The hardly surprising limiting factor is money and how affordable this whole enterprise would be to the general populace. It costs a big chunk of money, think millions, just to take a stroll into orbit. The founder of Amazon and Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos, spent around $55 million to get into orbit and see the International Space Station, or ISS for short. The real kicker is that he is spending an astonishing $5.5 billion for a mere four minutes of glory in space. So what drives individuals like Mr. Bezos to spend so much money, which more than three quarters of the Earth's population would not be able to afford in three lifetimes? The Commercial Spaceflight Federation, CSF for short, was founded in 2006 and has been the leading voice for commercial spaceflights ever since. It managed to draw in and commit 90-plus members with deep pockets. Whether this marshalling of wealth and resources leads to a bust or not has yet to be determined. Suppose those at the CSF were instrumental in elevating the concept of commercial spaceflight to new levels. How frequently could anyone expect these services into space to be offered? Is it akin to just stepping onto a bus or train, sitting down and waiting to be ferried to the destination and simply getting off again? The whole idea is to make it one day as simple as that. To lend credibility to that, the folks at CSF in earnest designed a reusable suborbital spacecraft. The key word is reusable. With minor preparatory operations and less time, more frequent flights can be conducted for experiments, instrument testing, or any other scientific means of data collection than ever before. Thanks to this, the CSF has a lot of influence on environmental, logistical, and regulatory topics related to spacefaring projects. This fact alone solidifies that CSF isn't going away anytime soon. Despite a decent start putting the vision into reality, it still leaves the question of the selling point or the hook for other businesses to invest in such a daring commercial endeavor. Companies are in the business of making money after all and are understandably skeptical of sales pitches about something that no one has ever tried before. Names such as SpaceX, Axiom Space and Boeing have flirted with the idea of making large-scale tourism an enticing reason for success. The pitch of leaving the confines of Earth and experience a new way of entertainment and relaxation in outer space certainly hits all of the right marketing tones. However, the risk of failure still remains an ominous possibility. That truth is not deterring any efforts. On the contrary, many resources and intellectuals are assembled and coordinated to push the abstract boundaries into something with more substance. After all, a dream, no matter how grand and complex, won't sell but must be a reality for it to be a good deal. With such grandeur projects also comes many moving parts that need to be considered and taken care of. Space is a harsh teacher and does not allow for many mistakes, and the scientists are fully aware of this. Manufacturing equipment, instruments and devices often require rare metals on Earth but in abundance in outer space. Collecting and processing these metals will be a significant component of any space project in the foreseeable future. As the topic of space travel makes the round, 
a new pseudo space race is seemingly taking shape. Countries like the UK, Japan, China, New Zealand, India and many more are flexing their proverbial muscles to be the first to achieve great new things. Tourism, profits and other reasons for funding such projects are undoubtedly clear motives. Still, a less commonly brought up reason is that humanity's time on this planet more than likely is finite. Earth may not remain the way it is today, nor may the sun be shining forever. There is a definitive peril and the feeling that we are on borrowed time where inactivity could be disastrous on the level of extinction. This lends itself to the possibility of finding a new home for humanity and Earth-based life, which further strengthens the justification for space travel efforts. From that angle, one can notice a shift in thinking from benefits and for profits only to the strategic necessity for survival and continued existence. Time pressure often elicits the question of when it will all happen and what is done about it. Unlike public or government-driven sectors, the private sector is also keenly aware of their own personal interests, which might occasionally clash with the state's interests. The intent, however, is not to compete, but to pick up the strings where the governments cannot or gave up on. That was the vision of SpaceX when they secured themselves 65% of the global commercial launch market and started designing spacecraft capable of transporting passengers. The ISS would be the beginning, but with Mars and beyond as possible new ambitions. Cost optimization, reusability of devices and components has been at the forefront and together supported the potential feasibility of expansive commercial flights. One example of a reusable device is SpaceX's Falcon 9, a reusable rocket. The pressure on SpaceX was enormous to create a unique and cost-effective vehicle. More so since other more traditional and public-funded space agencies have struggled to achieve the very same consistently. The Falcon 9 made launches a lot more affordable, resulting in profits by servicing the non-governmental and military branches. Any gains could then be reinvested into research and development. If this is keeping pace, then it can only be a matter of time until the cargo spaces of these Falcon 9 rockets are filled with tourists and passengers. Tourists and passengers have not been trained to be space crews. That is a fact and a challenge that must be masterfully and convincingly overcome to garner any favorable public opinion and trust, not unlike the dawn of the aviation industry. It takes astronauts months or even years of training and prep work, and space flights and walks are still a considerable risk even for them. The most vocal wants you to believe that space travel is a folly and an unnecessary resource drain, so convincing them of the contrary will require clever speeches and successful demonstrations of the safety and viability of spaceflight for the general public. The need to convince has driven up competition within the private sector. It has been highly beneficial in pushing new boundaries. Mars is an obvious choice as the next target, but why stop there? An increasing number of privately held companies are developing and deploying new technologies to facilitate new missions. Missions like future lunar landings or airplanes retrofitted as launch platforms for rockets. The fires of a booming space industry have been lit and new startups are appearing more frequently since. Partnerships and cross-company agency cooperation have also been discussed for future long-term plans. The benefits are clear. For example, private companies could use the ISS to conduct their own research, such as microgravity, vaccine development, and many more areas of scientific interest. In contrast, government-funded agencies would conduct their business as usual and would be a win-win situation for advancement, with neither stepping on each other deliberately. The future might look bright, but it does come with its own set of barriers, obstacles, and setbacks. How those in charge and with the budgets use the lessons learned from these setbacks will ultimately define the rate at which humanity will take its place among the stars as a space-faring civilization. The seeds were sown a long time ago and little sprouts are starting to show now. Each subsequent generation took new leaps in technology and reinforced humanity's continued awareness of its presence in the universe. To get closer to that vaunted future of space travel, exploration and beyond, which for now only exists firmly in science fiction. One day, you'll have to get used to people texting or telling you, hey, I'm having dinner on the moon with a friend, but I'll see you in San Fran at 8, cool? Tell us what you think in the comment section below and hit the like button for more.